Our challenges are great, but our will is greater. For three decades. Defeat sometimes is an important lesson. I, George Herbert Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. Seven presidential elections. This generation assumes new responsibilities. Frontline has investigated the candidates. That America's best days are yet to come. Who would be president? I, William Jefferson Clinton, do solemnly swear. We have to make the right choices. We will meet aggression with resolve and we strength. We have it in our power to change the world. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly the moments that shaped them. I won't let you down. I... Let it be said, we refused to let this journey end. That future is our destiny. The presidents they would become. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. We have to heal the divides in our country. I am your voice. And now on Frontline. At the end of this chapter of American darkness began here. The Choice 2020. Overnight, growing national unrest. With the nation in crisis, mobs sown chaos in cities across. This is the story of two candidates forged in their own crises. Political pundits said there was no way to be done. If the city would gather around with us. Personal tragedies. An automobile accident killed the wife and baby daughter of Biden. Of Public Donald. controversies. Trump's newspaper ads contribute to the city's racial polarization. Challenges that shaped them. Anita Hill comes to Washington. To tell me. The Donald is facing an incredible cash crisis. And show how they would lead a country now in crisis. Together, we are taking back our country. The Choice 2020. We're in a battle for the soul of America. Trump versus Biden. America wants to know. I'm Ernie Anastas, and this is the... In 1992, I hosted a special show in New York where viewers asked a lot of questions about their favorite celebrities. Many, of course, were interested in Donald Trump and what he was like as a young boy growing up in Queens. I managed to catch up with Donald's parents, Mary and Fred Trump, and asked them what was Donald's favorite game as a child. He played Monopoly. Yes, indeed. He, he played with play. his brother. Yeah. Uh -huh. He played with Robert. But more than Monopoly, he played with building blocks. Ooh. Always with building blocks. But Donald Trump's childhood was much more complicated. Early on, a family crisis. His mother seriously ill. When he was two and a half, my grandmother got very ill. Donald, who was at a very, very critical point in his development as a child, was essentially abandoned by her. He may not entirely trust women. He finds it difficult, if not impossible, to uh, connect with them on any deep level, because I don't believe he ever was able to with her. When you ask him about how she showed her love, he has nothing to say. The complexity of that relationship, I think, plays out through all of his relationships with women throughout his life. With one wife after another, there is a, an inability to reach any recognizable level of intimacy. Young Donald had his own crisis, finding his place in a family dominated by his father, Fred a stern and demanding real estate developer. I strongly suspect that he had a relationship with his father that accounts for a lot of what he became. And his father was a very brutal guy. He was a tough, hard, driving guy who had very, very little emotional intelligence, to use today's terms. Donald's father's overall message to his children was, and it was a very different message to the boys than to the girls, to the boys was compete, win, be a killer. Do what you have to to win. Inside the family, a harsh game of apprentice. Who would take over Fred's empire? The first in line wasn't Donald. It was his older brother, Freddie. My father was sensitive. He was kind and generous. He liked hanging out with his friends who adored him. 
And maybe worst of all, although it's hard to say, he had interest outside of the family business. My grandfather understood none of that. Their father said Freddie wasn't a killer. He wanted to fly airplanes for a living. Donald thought that was crazy. They could not understand why Fred did not go into the family business and be a builder uh, like their father was. Um, but Fred wanted to be a pilot, and Donald looked at that and said, well, that's sort of like being a bus driver. Why would you want to be a pilot? Donald watched as Freddie was cast out. My dad couldn't do anything right, and my grandfather made his life miserable. He was frustrated, and he began to realize that he was, it wasn't going anywhere. His life ended early in alcoholism and poor health. Through the years, Donald would take a much different path. He wanted to avoid my father's fate of, you know, abuse and humiliation at the hands of his father. He took that lesson to heart. He was determined to live up to his father's ideal, be a killer. But he was also tempestuous, impulsive, and at 13, his father sent him to military school. He must have said, this kid's gonna grow up in a tough world, really tough world. And if I want him to succeed, he's gonna have to be tough. He talks about it as almost this rite of passage. He said to me that when he arrived at the military academy, for the first time in his life, someone slapped him in the face when he got out of line. It would be a five-year lesson in how to be a bully. Donald Trump yelled at his classmates. He pushed them around. He even used a broomstick uh, as a weapon against classmates who didn't listen to him when he told them what to do. All of us were part of this culture of you beat on kids when they didn't do the right thing. You got hit, you might have gotten slammed against the wall. You were put in, in, in uh, you got put artificially into fights. Uh. He became a leader of the cadets. He became one of the student leaders uh, who had a number of kids under him uh, in the dormitories, and he ruled the dormitory life with an iron fist. Inside that brutal world, Donald had found his place. His mother told me that he was never homesick. He loved it. He loved all that stuff because it was also really competitive. Other kids didn't really like him all that much. He, he wasn't that popular because he was so competitive. He was always looking for the edge. But it was an it was a environment that he thrived in. With his father and mother by his side, Donald graduated. He'd become a killer, learned the power of bullying to get ahead, a method he'd carry into the future. Biden's crisis was stuttering. He came of age in a, another time in which people weren't as open about disorders or disabilities or setbacks. When the 
common prescription was buck up. Deal with it. Dealing with it. A rough and tumble childhood in Delaware. His father, a car salesman, fallen on hard times. For little Joey, Catholic school. Nuns. He had an assignment he had to memorize. He had to stand up and deliver it in the classroom. The words were in front of him. Sir Walter Raleigh was a gentleman. When Joe read it, it went, Sir Walter Raleigh was a gentleman. Say that again. Mm. Sir Walter Raleigh was a gentle man. And this went on three times. He said, gentle man instead of gentleman. And the nun said, Mr. Biden, what's that word? And this is a person in a position of authority. This is a person who's meant to protect you. It was uh, so embarrassing and so enraging that Biden walked out of the room. He walked out of the school. He walked all the way home. Joey's mom, Jean, marched him back to the school to confront his teacher. The sister starts telling him how disrespectful Joe's and my mother stop. She said, just tell me, did you make fun of my son? Well, I, sister, did you make fun of my son? Well, and my mother said, well, I'll answer it for you. You sure in hell did. And if you ever, ever, ever do that again, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna knock your bonnet right off your head. Do, do we understand each other? Stuttering is a fear problem. The person feels fear, shame, guilt, tension. He's always worried about what might happen. He might get into a situation and not be able to say his name, or the telephone rings and he can't answer it. I was surprised at how often this subject came up during my time with him. It helped me understand that so much of who he is comes back to that that people are ready to make fun of him, that people will laugh. Bullied, harassed, ridiculed, he was hell-bent on beating the stutter. Biden would stand in front of his bedroom mirror, holding a flashlight to his face. And he would recite Yeats and Emerson. He kept pushing against the stutter, the bullies, and it paid off. People liked to be around him. He really had a presence. You knew him when he walked in. He was a little taller than, than most and uh, in very good shape. He was a, a star football player on their team. Joey Biden found another way to fight back, politics. In high school, he's president of his senior class. Um, honestly, that's when he gets a taste for it. The stutter is still part of him <laughs> um, during his senior year in high school, um, where he has to introduce his family at, the, at, the, at graduation, and he has to uh, stand up there and not stutter and say this publicly, and he does it. In the crisis of stuttering, a life method. Persevere, just push through. Or in medical research to conquer, to conquer devastating diseases like cancer. Not the end in, in, themselves, in themselves. UAW took incredible cuts in their future. Many people would say Biden's a stutter is among his most visible weaknesses, if not number one. 
but it's also a source of his uh, strength. It's also the main source of his grit and his determination to just be there competing. This is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Good evening. For seven months, New York City has teetered on the brink of financial disaster. Another piece of New York fell by the curbside today for who knows how long. By the 1970s, New York City was in crisis. employees is part of the struggle to keep the city from going bankrupt. New York City suddenly comes apart. The city, for the first time, was losing population as well as jobs and losing its economic base. New York was in tatters then, but there were opportunities everywhere you looked. The New York City of the early 1970s was made for someone like Donald Trump. In that crisis, 25-year-old Donald Trump saw a chance for personal gain. He was struggling to make a name for himself, break out of his father's shadow. Donald, from a very young age, wanted to exceed his father and go into Manhattan and be the success that his father hadn't been in terms of notoriety and fame. Trump took his shot. It started with a rundown hotel near Grand Central Station. The old Commodore Hotel was in such sorry shape that it had boarded up windows, it had rodents all over the place. It was uh, one of the markers of New York's sorry decline. And Trump saw this as a grand opportunity. In New York City, the rate of unemployment is much higher than it is It was an enormous gamble, but with the city on the brink. And so the city continues to stagger beneath the weight of its multiplying fiscal problems. Trump believed New York was desperate enough to pay him to transform the hotel. If the city would gather around with us, we can produce with a lease guaranteed by the state of New York, a New York City lease. But he was new to Manhattan. He needed a guide. He found Roy Cohn. Roy, who was a rough and tumble fixer, Democrat, power within the Democratic power structure in New York City, close friend of Mayor Abe Beam, close friend of Carmine DiSapio, the boss of the Manhattan Democratic Party. I think he was like Donald's ambassador to the world of Manhattan. Cohn had been disgraced for leading McCarthy era witch hunts but Trump saw him as a killer. Roy cultivated an image as a bulldog. Nothing, nothing would stop him from tarring opponents or even doing illegal things. His pride and joy was bullying people and bribing people and making deals behind the scenes. He was a fixer, he was a connector. Roy Cohn was the kind of master of the dark arts. He was the person who helped shape Trump's approach to life. What he learned from Roy Cohn was never apologize, always attack, attack the, the character of your opponents, that they're somehow malicious, that they're somehow doing the devil's deed here, and, and let the public know that. That was Roy Cohn. Cohn knew just how to get the tax breaks Trump needed to build his hotel. Roy Cohn, because of his unique positioning within New York City at that time, was able to pull certain strings to get tax breaks. New York taxpayers would be on the hook for more than $400 million. He's able to set up this deal, which the state bills as a special new program, but isn't a special new program. It is just a giveaway to Donald Trump, a tax giveaway. It's been a long, hard fight. How do you feel? Well, I'm very happy, and I think the city of New York is going to be very happy. He transformed the Commodore Hotel. With Cohn's help, Trump had thrived in crisis, used it to his advantage. The mayor and the governor of New York were among those on hand for the ribbon-counting ceremony. He got it done. He got it done 
by bullying his way through, by pretending to have more backers than he really had, by pretending that he was actually putting large sums of money into it when he really wasn't. Uh, and the con worked. He got the money, he got the permits, he got it done. You use deception, you use intimidation, you use all of the tactics that you can find. It is a utterly transactional sense of the world. And what's in it for me is the kind of founding credo. One of the things that Donna learned from School of Dad and School of Roy was that almost everybody has their price. Whatever, it might not necessarily be dollars, although it often is. It might be some vulnerability that won't be revealed, but Roy said that almost everyone, there's a pressure point. It would become Trump's playbook. Exploit crisis in business, in life, in politics. Joe Biden also had a role model. Irish, Catholic, good-looking. Joe emulated what he could. Kennedy was drawn to politics. Biden was drawn to politics. Jack had a photogenic wife and children. Joe had a photogenic wife and children. The Kennedys had a family compound at Hyannisport. The Bidens would have a family compound in Wilmington, Delaware. Joe Biden was always fascinated by the Kennedy mystique. He really saw himself as a natural heir to that tradition. I'm Joe Biden, and I'm a candidate for the United States Senate. Politicians have done such a job on the people that the people don't believe them anymore. And I'd like a shot at changing that. But Wilmington was no high sport. We, the Bidens, we had no money, we had no power or influence. We didn't know anybody who was a big name who could help us. Hi, how are you? Hi, Joe how are Biden's you? Biden's my name. My name like the crisis over his stutter, his political start was a struggle. Behind in the polls, facing a powerful opponent, United States Senator Cale Boggs, an ally of President Richard Nixon. Joe Biden asked me about getting involved in his campaign. I started off by telling him that there's no way you can win. Cale Boggs was the uh, candidate for the Senate. He'd been a two-term congressman, two-term uh, governor, two-term senator. He was beloved around the state. So I said that you couldn't win. Audacious is a good term to apply to Biden back then. This is a guy who wasn't yet old enough to hold the seat. It was a time of crisis in the country. The Vietnam War had divided Americans. Opposition to the war in Vietnam to set off demonstrations in several major cities. Igniting social unrest. In Delaware, racial tensions boiled over. The National Guard was called out in several cities to put down riots. One of these cities was Wilmington, Delaware. Black residents were angry. Joe Biden saw an opportunity to draw on his personal experience with race. Back when he was 19, working at an inner city pool. He was a lifeguard. He was one of the two white guys. He was a tall, slim, uh, young looking, uh, good looking, Albus Presley looking kind of guy. That's how he got to know some of the guys who were in the gangs. He just seemed to have a natural instinct for getting to know people, getting to understand them, but not being afraid to be around them. We became friends. We became friends. I was a very troubled child, OK? Lay up a gang, no food at home, lecture to cut off, no soap. Uh, Sometimes no soap and water to, to take a bath, no hot water. Joe and Ricky, he likes to be called Mouse, forged a lifetime friendship after beating a shared demon. They both stuttered. 
I understand back there for black black folks back those days. When you stutter, you was retarded, or you was, or you were something with mental wrong with you. I, I, I start with the, uh... So he basically told me, go to the mayor, look at yourself, pronounce your words. Go and put your voice on tape. Well, my words did change. I started reading papers from back, from the back to the fore, back and forth. Mouse introduced Joe all around the neighborhood. Over the years, Biden kept in touch, building relationships in the black community that would pay off. He go through this personalizing with people. I never really heard him say, I'm gonna change the, the community. I'm, I'm gonna deal with employment. I'm gonna deal with how, you know, the typical politician mess that you hear. Uh, I always tell people, be weary of any politician who tells you he's gonna create jobs. He's lying to you. Some people are in politics because they're in love with policy, but they're not necessarily in love with humans. He loves the game of it. He loves the dance of it. He loves meeting people. He loves hugging strangers. It became his go-to strategy. President Nixon's landslide didn't help the Republicans. And in 1972, that method worked. Some of those who did lose had been considered the most certain to win. The black community helped make Joe Biden a winner. In Delaware, two by less than 3,000 votes. Whipped by 29-year-old Joseph Biden. It was very close. People were still surprised, at, you know, how this even happened. All of you have done something that the political pundit said there was no way in the world it could be done. That night, all the college kids were so excited. A lot of us went to the Hotel DuPont ballroom, and it was packed, packed. And there was so much excitement in the air. I saw this woman coming through the crowd, and I realized that it was Nelia, Joe's wife. And so I walked up to her, and I shook her hand, and I said, uh, congratulations on your win. And she said, thank you very much. And that was our exchange. The war of the Trumps has ignited a battle of the tabloids. The unfolding saga of Trump versus Trump. A high octane mix of the stuff that sells newspapers. They called it the divorce of the century. Trump versus Trump. It was on page one, page two. I likened it to World War III. I never saw publicity equal to that. Ford's linking Trump to a bevy of beauties. This time, it was a crisis Donald created himself. Georgia cast as the other woman. He'd been cheating on his wife, Ivana. He was in a real crisis, and there had been scandal after scandal in the tabloids. His children were sobbing. Ivanka was sobbing. Donald Jr. was apparently not speaking to his father. And Donald's mother said to someone who was very close to her, I don't know who my son is anymore. The marriage that produced the divorce of the century had begun more than a decade before at a trendy New York bar. She was a model out on the town with friends. Donald came up and introduced himself. Hi, I'm Donald Trump. And I see that you're having a problem getting a table. So he went over to the major d' and next thing you know, the girls had a table. An immigrant from Czechoslovakia, she was going places, what Fred Trump would call a killer. The interesting thing about Ivana is I consider her to be every bit as ambitious as Donald and every bit as committed to remaking herself or creating herself. Ivana Zelnichkova had become Mrs. Trump, but that was just the start. She said to me, oh, you know, I'm going to go to work for Donald. I said, what? 
you're getting married and you're going to work? I never heard of anything like that. Don't you get married not to go to work? She goes, no, I told them that I want a job. Give me any job. I don't care what it is. I can't sit at home. I love to work. I like to see the final product. Uh, I just, uh, I don't care what kind of business it is in or what kind of work it is. I just adore to work. I can't sit home and look up at the ceiling. It's just not enough for me. She was driven too. Driven, driven, driven. Ivana Trump was Donald's like they were born from the same sperm. Donald and Ivana mimicked each other, you know, so they were like a ball of fire. Its opening party was one to end them all. Guests, thousands of them mingled with LaClique's madcap performance. Together, they headlined Trump's biggest real estate project, Trump Tower. And as he expanded into Atlantic City, she became CEO of one of the casinos. In Manhattan, she took charge of the iconic Plaza Hotel. But it would not last. Havana, in the beginning, that was great. It was very refreshing. He had this powerful woman by his side, but it grew tiresome for him. And why did it grow tiresome for him? Because there are no co-stars in Trump's orbit. There's only one spotlight, and it's on him. When things went well, he became enormously jealous of the attention she got. And when things went poorly, he became extremely angry and insulting and vindictive toward her. During Ivana's renovation of the plaza, Trump's resentment boiled over. We came in and saw the finished room, and the first thing, he didn't like the furniture, and he started cursing out Ivana, and he pulled the door off a piece of furniture. He was so angry. I, I never saw him so angry in my life. He was very scary that day. He was very, very angry. Do you all argue? In public, Trump made it clear how he felt. We should have world record setting fights, but we really don't. We get along very well, and there's not a lot of disagreement because ultimately, Ivana does exactly as I tell her to do. <laughs> you see, wait a minute. You may I'm have a chauvinist. <laughs> right, right oh men, God. is that right? <laughs> huh? In the eye of the tabloid storm, Ivana said she was doing everything she could to hold on to her life and her power. She starts weeping. And I said, Ivana, what is it? She says, you, you don't know what it's like. You just have to deal with him when you work for him. I have him 24 hours a day. And I felt so terribly sorry. I mean, she really did everything she possibly could to please Donald. And I think she got the short end of the stick. A marital split between the billionaire builder and his father. out, board. there's rumor of another woman. And the wounded but for Trump, the crisis was made to order. He leaked stories to feed the media firestorm. One of the things he really learned from Roy was the manipulation of the celebrity press, the so-called society of press, page six, the Daily News. He plays them like a piano. New York's tabloids having a field day reported Ivana wants a lot These more tactics and techniques that he learned over time, that he picked up from Roy Cohn and his father, and everything he gleaned from those people could be directed at the closest people in his life, including his wife. This personal crisis taught Trump another life lesson never share power again. We've seen it in Trump's presidency when aides become too out front in their own right, he reacts in ways that sort of shove those figures back down to maintain the role of primacy that he not only seeks but needs. He's 30. Joe Biden had it all. Three children, wife Nelia at his side, about to take a seat in the Senate. I was assigned to do uh, a long, long piece on him. 
something like, you know, young Mr. Biden goes to Washington. That's when I spent a good bit of time with Joe. And I had lunch with Nelia in the course of uh, doing the story. And I just thought to myself, you know, God, this couple, you know, really has everything. It's a love story. He met her on a beach in spring break in college. They fell within days madly in love. Nelia was the love of his life, and it was really a happily ever after tale. Until it isn't abruptly. Biden and his sister Val were in Washington setting up the office, hiring a staff when the crisis hit. The phone rings, and, and Val gets it. And um, Biden is sort of paying attention. And then he really starts paying attention when he sees her face. And I got a call from Jimmy Biden and uh, said, come home now. There's been an accident. And uh, Nelia was in the car, the station wagon, with the three children, Bo Hunt and Naomi. Nelia was br br literally bringing home the Christmas tree with the kids in the car, the three kids in the car. Campaign flyers from the car helped identify the bodies. She was hit broadside by a tractor trailer. And she and Naomi, who sat behind her in the car seat, uh, they died instantly. And Bo and Hunter were seriously injured. And he, he knew, he knew, he knew from the look on her face. My brother looked at me and said, uh, she's dead, isn't she? And I said, uh, I don't know, Joey. I did know, Jimmy told me. His sons were in the hospital hours away. The pain cut through like a shard of broken glass. I began to understand how despair led people to just cash it in. How suicide wasn't just an option, but a rational option. In six short weeks, he went from being on top of the world to being a, a young widower, a father of two children, and uh, a single dad, and uh, a man with, you know, a broken heart. He got to the boys. They were all that was left. Broken hips, legs, arms. Bo was all cut up and Hunter's skull was fractured. Since the accident, Biden himself been living at a hospital in Wilmington, Delaware, taking care of his sons. Today, the senator took his swearing-in ceremony. Joseph Biden, Democrat of Delaware. Somehow, Biden pulled it together. They held a swearing-in ceremony at the hospital. It means a lot to me. I appreciate it, and I hope that I can be a good center for you all. I make this one promise that uh, if in six months or so there's a conflict between my being a good father and being a good senator, which I hope will not occur, I thought would, but I hope it won't, uh, I promise you that I will, uh, will contact Governor-elect Tribbett, as I had earlier, and uh, tell him that uh, we can always get another senator, but they can't get another father. The road ahead for Joe Biden would be tough, like the fight against stuttering and the uphill political battle. Once again, in crisis, he would persevere. Valerie's going to help raise the children. He's going to have a job in Washington and a home in Wilmington, and he's going to ride that train back and forth. He's going to be home for dinner uh, every night with his kids and his sister, and that's going to be the family unit. It's not the one he chose but that's going to be the one. You don't lose a wife and child at the point in life that he did and not grow from it. You learn from those kinds of experiences. Uh, what you do, though, uh, is like uh, uh, Muhammad Ali said one time, I've never been knocked down. I've always been getting up. Uh, so uh, Joe just never been knocked down. Uh, he's always been getting up.
For some people, the ultimate goal in The question was first asked on TV when he was 34 years old. Would you like to be the president of the United States? I really don't believe I would, Rona, but I would like to see somebody as the president who could do the job. The question would not go away. Political presidential talk to me, and I know people have talked to you about whether or not you want to run. Would you, would you ever? Probably not, but I, I do get tired of seeing the country ripped off. You've been indicating that you could do it better and you do intend to run for president at some no, point? No, I'm not going to run for president. But yeah, but if you want something done right, do it yourself. <laughs> not only does his ego get fed, he gets a nice note from Richard Nixon, who's seen him on television. Mrs. Nixon told me that you were great on The Donahue Show. She predicts that whenever you decide to run for office, you will be a winner. Donald proudly framed this letter and showed it to me uh, at the time we were working together on interviews. He'd made his mark in Manhattan exploiting an economic crisis. Now he'd take on another crisis and raise his profile yet again. It is Christmas Eve in New York, and the talk of the town is not peace on earth, but the violence among us. A vigilante who shot and wounded four young men over the weekend. To have it happen in New York City, unbelievable. In the New York City version of a racial lynching. The man is dead. Somebody got to go to jail for that. No justice! No peace! No Crime and racial tensions were tearing New York City apart. And not one killing or a hundred killings are going to stop us from going where we want to go. Trump seized on one headline. A jogger is fighting for her life after a brutal attack in Central Park. She is a white Wall Street investment banker. Her black attackers being called animals in the media. Whose savage beating and gang rape has provoked outrage in a city fit. It is the ages of the accused, 14 to 17 years old, and the horror of their alleged crimes that has caused a furor. The defendants are about to have their two months in court. Raymond Santana, Yusef Salam, Antron McCray, they are finally through. There's a rush to judge because there's a rush to solve the crime. Yusef Salam's arrest was at the center of the storm. We became what was wrong. We became expendable. Trump saw this classic tabloid story. He saw his role and his position instinctively. He knew in his heart that those guys were bad. As in so many other areas, his attitude towards race was shaped by his father. He was being raised by a father who was discriminating against African Americans in the very first apartments with the Trump name. He was raised in this setting where the people of color and the black people that he saw were people who were working for him. It was his father's driver. They were just a very racist family, uh, you know. People of color, you know, African Americans in particular, Jewish people, women, were all considered fair game. And, you know, racism, anti-Semitism, and misogyny were very common in my grandparents' house. And it was just the way it was. Trump took out full-page ads in four city newspapers. Trump took the extraordinary step of buying a full-page ad in four New York newspapers. We hadn't even gone to trial yet. Two weeks passes, and we are essentially given a death sentence with this ad. They should be executed for their crimes. I want them to understand our anger. I want them to be afraid. And then, then he signs his name at the very bottom. People don't sign their name to things that they're not proud of. Uh, the ads are basically are very strong and vocal. They are saying, bring back law and order to our cities. This ad was a whisper into the darkest, most sinister parts of society. You better believe that I hate the people that took this girl and raped her brutally. You better believe it. And it's more than anger, it's hatred. And I want society to hate him. And Trump found a way to insert himself into the story, to signal where he was on these issues, and, and began to learn the lesson that if you can capture that fear, and you can become the champion for those afraid people, that there's a lot of political opportunity in that. In the process, Trump had touched a nerve and found a sympathetic audience. 
I've never done anything that's caused a more positive stir. I've had 15,000, 15,000 letters in the last week and a half. Uh, I don't know of more than two or three that were negative out of 15,000. Thank you, Donald. He's learning how to dip his toe in and out of these remarkably racially incendiary issues. He's learning how to dog whistle. He's learning how to signal. Um, and also learning how to do that while keeping a little bit of distance. More than a decade later, new information has blown the case. There were cheers in a New York City courtroom today. It turns out they apparently got the wrong guy. The Central Park Five were released from prison. It turned out another man entirely had done this rape, and these kids were innocent. They'd been not only publicly exonerated, but officially exonerated. But Trump would not apologize then, nor over the years when the subject came up. We went to prison for a crime that we didn't commit. Still to this day, we still have not been apologized to from the people who harmed us in that way, that political way, right? It was part of the Roy Cohn playbook that Trump continued to use. Fan the fires of division. Get what you want. Move on. You can almost draw a straight line from what he did with the Central Park Five to then on to birtherism. I mean, there is something within Donald Trump um, that makes him drawn to those kinds of issues. Very, very divisive issues that are aimed at a particular part of the electorate or the population that in one way or another stir things up. After 14 years in the Senate, Joe Biden was going for the big one, running for president. It was a family affair. The boys were older now. He had remarried, had a new daughter. You know, he said, let's just test the waters. And so I said, all right. I mean, it sort of just snowballed. And we were into it, really, before we even knew it. But as he campaigned, he headed towards another crisis stemming from a persistent question. What did he stand for? I think that's always been one of his challenges. As he tries to go for president, he casts about for what he wants to say. He casts about for the issues he wants to put forward and what he wants to say he believes in. And it, and it feels cast about. Then one day, a video, a story, that would give him something to say. Why am I the first Kinnick in a thousand generations to be able to get the university? Obsessed with the tape, Biden studied it. He later wrote, the ad was riveting. I couldn't take my eyes off Neil Kinnock. Is it because they were weak? Those people who could wait, work eight hours underground and then come up and play football, weak? Biden could put himself into the Neil Kinnock story. Um, family in Scranton, Pennsylvania, family in the mines. And so, in, in a sense, he absorbed the Kinnick story and making it his own. The campaign begins in earnest with the first votes for the next president in Iowa. The candidate spent much of yesterday fanned out... In Iowa, during the primary, he took Kinnick's words, made them his own. Uh, now, Mr. Biden. Thank you very much. Uh, I started thinking as I was coming over here, why is it that Joe Biden is the first in his family ever to go to a university? He got up there and he gave a speech and he got to the end, the last three minutes, and he gave Kinnick, but he did not attribute it to Kinnick. Is it because they didn't work hard? My ancestors who worked in the coal mines in Northeast Pennsylvania and come up after 12 hours and play football for four hours? And Joe Biden borrowed it and applied it to his own life and made a moving sort of aria, a moving sort of part of a speech about his own life, which in fact had been taken from Neil Kinnock. I hope you'll consider me. Thank you very much. And that concludes the Economic for America debate. Democratic presidential candidate Joseph Biden today faces a controversy. Biden seems to be claiming Kinnock's vision and life as his own. It became front page news. Biden has then been caught with a sudden, embarrassing to, uh, comparison of his recent campaign speeches. The first example came from Great Britain. Why am I 
the first Kinect in a thousand generations to be able to get the university. And I started thinking as I was coming over here, why is it that Joe Biden is the first in his family ever to go to a university? His campaign said it was a mistake, that he had cited Kinnick other times. But then the avalanche. Looks like a Joe Biden wind-up doll with somebody else's words coming out. Allegations of failing to cite a source in a law school paper. Plagiarized a law review article. Taking lines from his political idols, the Kennedys. One from John Kennedy's inaugural, others from Robert Kennedy. Their words from the lips of Joe Biden. When he was accused of plagiarism, we felt that, you know, his character was being attacked and it sort of took us back. Thank you for coming. I apologize for not being able In to trouble, last night. Biden tried to do what he'd always done. I did not say, to paraphrase Neil Kinnock, I should have. Apologize. I should have known it was Robert Kennedy's quote. I did not know that. Admit his that's mistakes. Mistake. And I've done some dumb things, and I'll do dumb things again. Persevere. But I tell you one thing. My learning curve is moving on this presidential race. And I want to tell them all, I'm in this race to stay, I'm in this race to win, and here I come. Thanks a lot, folks. He thought he could put it behind him, but then. Well, this does not mark the beginning of a better week for Senator Joseph Biden. Today, he's having to defend what he has said in public about his record at law school and what the record really shows. One real quick question. <laughs> what law school did you attend, and where did you place in that class? And Insulted. His anger was on full display. I, I think I probably have a much higher IQ than you do, I suspect. I went to law school on a full academic scholarship. Joe Biden's always been very sensitive to the perception that he's being disrespected. And when that happens, those are the moments when he tends to erupt. The only one in my, in my class uh, to have a full academic scholarship, and in fact ended up in the top half of my class. I won the international moot court competition. But Syracuse University Law School records released by Biden just last week show he sought a partial, not full scholarship for financial, not academic reasons. That he finished not in the top half, but 76th out of 85 students. Joe Biden comes off as someone who has a lot of self-confidence, but obviously there's an imposter syndrome dynamic at work here because if you feel like you have to make up stuff about yourself and invent stories that are not your own and then do it in such a self-destructive way in which you can be caught, that speaks to a level of character and certainly insecurity Hello, everybody. that is common among a lot of politicians. I'm delightful to see you all here. You know my wife, Jill? Pulling out of the 1987 presidential race was really devastating to to Joe and to me and to our family. The exaggerated shadow of those mistakes has begun to obscure the essence of my candidacy and the essence of Joe Biden. He recognized that this was a fatal blow to his hopes of winning the nomination in 1988. And I think it was a very painful decision. Thanks, folks. My wife and I thank you very much. And Tommy Biden lost this fight. Delaware Senator Joseph Biden dropped out of the hunt. Joe Biden blames mostly himself. He returned to the Senate, continued his method, persevere through it all. Real estate developer Donald Trump opened his new casino, the Taj Mahal, in Atlantic City today. Is this the eighth wonder of the world? The Taj Mahal shines as Trump's slickest deal. The biggest crisis of Donald Trump's business career began with one giant bet. It certainly represented something bigger and bolder and probably what was going to be the greatest statement ever made in Atlantic City. And so it was a big deal. It was a big deal to Donald. The casino was the size of two football fields. Trump said he spent $14 million on chandeliers. His bet, $1 billion. People were mobbing Donald. I was shocked. I couldn't believe that, you know, that asking him for his autograph and everything. I mean, he had just catapulted into this rock star. In TV reports, Trump bragged that he was the reason the Taj would be a success. Paul needs to make over $1 million a day to cover expenses. Trump says his business sense and ego will make it happen. Ego is an interesting thing. I mean, I, I have always been referred to as somebody with a big ego, but. I really believe that 
I've never met a successful person without a very large ego. And if you don't have a big ego, you're not going to be successful. It's as simple as that. Ego was central to Trump's method. But there was something else, positive thinking, a technique he'd learned with his father at this Manhattan church. It was the place to be seen for business leaders, socialites, politicians, and the Trumps. Every Sunday, he would show up at Marble Collegiate Church to go to Norman Vincent Peale's services. The God who made this world was a wise God. He wants people who live life and like it, love it. I think part of it was this positive message that Peel had that you could achieve anything you wanted. There was nothing that could stop you. Peel's book, The Power of Positive Thinking, taught followers visualization, envisioning the world that they wanted. One reason that the positive thinker gets positive results is he is not afraid of a problem. It's this toxic positivity that perfectly fit in with what my grandfather already thought. Everything's great, you know, and if you think that way, then everything will be great. The problem is everything is not always great. How then can you face the future with confidence? The three influences on Donald Trump, as I sometimes describe them, are School of Dad, School of Fred Trump, School of Roy, Roy Cohn, and School of Norman Vincent Peale. It was Peale's kind of outlook that carried Trump into Atlantic City, with the vision of his name in lights, Trump Plaza, Trump Castle, then the billion dollar Trump Taj, paid for with junk bonds. I don't think Donald Trump spent one minute worrying about debt. If he introduced doubt into his life, the whole, the whole thing would unravel. Trump was warned repeatedly he was headed for disaster, but he dismissed the warnings. He doesn't really like hearing bad news. An optimist sometimes is so optimistic that they don't want to hear anything, that even if they're heading right off a cliff, they might not want to hear the news. What worries some analysts is the amount of junk bond debt Trump has incurred to build the Taj Mahal. Inevitably, reporters began to question whether Trump's vision could be profitable. Trump says he believes they will. The Taj Mahal is going to be a tremendous success. That's when Trump turned to a key Roy Cohn lesson, attack the media. When CNN tried to pursue some of these matters with Trump, this is what happened. Do, do this interview with somebody else. When we talked about this yesterday on the phone. This is exactly do what the, we talked about. Do the interview with somebody else, really. Yeah, you don't need this. Do it with somebody else and have a good time with it because frankly, you're a very negative guy and uh, I think it's very unfair reporting. Good luck. It's just classic denial. If you're an expert and you agree with Donald Trump, you're a genius, but if you're an expert and you disagree with him, you're a loser. He ignored the experts, but they had been right. Trump's casino business will file for bankruptcy next month. Trump's casinos declared bankruptcy. The word is you're bankrupt. After bankruptcy. Trump, all three casinos are facing bankruptcy. After bankruptcy. The chapter 11 bankruptcy protects. The collapse of the casinos devastated Trump's investors and Atlantic City. Bankruptcy is a situation where people are losing. They're getting pennies on the dollar. The banks clearly lost out. So did the people of Atlantic City, who lost jobs, who lost their tax base. That's what happens in a bankruptcy, and that's what happened in these Atlantic City bankruptcies. But Trump, as always, refused to admit failure. That is sort of it, Norm Vincent Peale, hold on tenaciously, hold on to this image of yourself as successful, never let go of it, never let the idea of failure enter your mind. And I call it a beautiful puzzle. The crisis in Atlantic City also solidified another method Trump would come to rely on. I know more about ISIS than the generals do, believe me. Believe in yourself over experts. The experts are terrible. Look at the mess we're in with all these experts that we have. Reject the naysayers. We have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China. Declare victory, no matter what. And we have it under control. It's uh, going to be just fine.
But in Bush said he has no doubt Clarence Thomas will be confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Thomas will try to persuade the Senate that he has no... 1991. Joe Biden, now the powerful chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, was facing his biggest crisis yet. Allegations against Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas. This affidavit charged that Thomas sexually harassed a former employee, Anita Hill. Good evening. We begin tonight with the potential for political explosion on Capitol Hill. Clarence Thomas ran into trouble today. Questions are growing over charges of sexual harassment against Thomas. <laughs> it seems to have been a nightmare for Joe Biden. As a man, he felt uncomfortable about it. As a white man, he felt uncomfortable taking Clarence Thomas, a black man, on about it. Um, and the whole subject matter just made him incredibly uncomfortable. Another witness who's come forward against Thomas. Of a second woman who once worked for Thomas. Biden was at first reluctant to have Hill testify, but the story was exploding. There were actually three other women other than myself who were willing to testify, who had actually said they called Senator Biden's office and, and offered their own testimony. Angela Wright offered her own stark allegations against Thomas, which Thomas denied. He asked me in one situation what size breast my breasts were. He told me he wanted to date me. This is a man who has all, who in my opinion, has often spoken inappropriately to women. But committee chairman Biden conceded tonight that new information about the allegations. With the pressure mounting, Biden agreed to let the women testify. The hearing will come to order. Welcome, Professor Hill. Professor, do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Thank you. Biden's committee was all white men the men of the Senate, as they were called. There was not a single woman who might have understood her story from a woman's point of view. Can you tell the committee what was the most embarrassing of all the incidences that you have alleged? I think the one that was the most embarrassing was his discussion of, of pornography involving these women with large breasts and, and ha engaged in variety of sex with different people or, or animals. That was the thing that embarrassed me the most and made me feel the most humiliated. He's kind of in the middle of the road. I'm a Southern woman and I've always heard that the only thing in the middle of the road is roadkill and yellow stripes. And then you have to take a position, and you have to decide what you stand for. He didn't know whose side to come down on. Thank you. Uh, my, my time is uh, up under our agreement. Let me now yield to my friend from Pennsylvania, uh, Senator Specter. Biden's close friend, Republican Arlen Specter, led the charge against Hill. I find the references to the alleged sexual harassment not only unbelievable, but preposterous. He cast doubt on her memory. How reliable is your testimony in October of 1991 on events that occurred eight, ten years ago? He suggested she was exaggerating. You took it to mean that Judge Thomas wanted to have sex with you, but in fact, he never did ask you to have sex, correct? No, he did not ask me to have sex. That was an inference. Yes. That you drew. Yes. My, my, my red light is on. Thank you much, very much, Professor Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Professor Hill. Will it... Joe Biden allowed members of that committee to grill Professor Hill in a way that was inappropriate and humiliating. He could have done something to provide her with some support, some comfort, but that didn't happen. Biden gave Clarence Thomas the last word. He strongly denied the allegations. This is a circus. It's a national disgrace. And from my standpoint, as a black American, as far as I'm concerned, it is a high-tech lynching for uppity blacks by a committee 
of the US, U.S. Senate rather than hung from a tree. Very powerful. I mean, what it did was it shamed these white senators. And it certainly seemed to shame the Democrats, who had just been accused of lynching a black man. With that, Biden moved to wrap up the hearings. Angela Wright and the other women accusing Thomas would not testify. He'd end up voting against Thomas, but his handling of the hearing damaged him politically. It made him the face of an out-of-touch body and really wounded his prospects of a future run for president. He had some work to do. <laughs> so he had some reputational rehab to do. Biden turned to his method for survival in crisis, acknowledge the problem, and repair the damage. Joe is always able to say, yeah, I didn't handle that quite right. Let me, I'm, let me see what I can do better the next time. Carol Mosley Braun has entered political history. She's the first African-American woman elected to the U.S. Senate. Big changes here, a kind that have history written all over them. Fixing things began by recruiting the first black woman elected to the United States Senate. Braun's anger over the Clarence Thomas hearings turned her into a candidate. Biden wanted to make sure Mosley Braun joined his committee. I made a joke which he didn't think was funny at all. I said, you just want to need a hill on the other side of the table. He did not laugh. He didn't think it was funny. And he still probably doesn't. <laughs> but he convinced her and Dianne Feinstein to join the committee, beginning once again to rebuild. My name's Donald Trump, and I'm the largest real estate developer in New York. I own buildings all over the place, model agencies, the Miss Universe pageant, jetliners, golf courses. Having prevailed in spite of personal and financial crises, Donald Trump was now making crisis his brand. For 14 seasons, he played the role of a mogul, as if he were still one in real life. His financial dynasty toppling like a house of cards. In the wreckage of Atlantic City, Trump had changed Trump's course. Trump's name once meant gold. Today it means trouble. And doubled down on what had been a side business, celebrity. He's always saw himself as a potential TV or entertainment star. It's another part of his, his personality, is he likes to be an entertainer. Donald Trump. On TV. Excuse me, where's the lobby? Movies. Down the hall and to the left. Thanks. McDonald is here. Lobby. In the ring. He always played the same character, himself. The hostile takeover of Donald Trump. What he was selling was a brand. He learned that he just had to keep being relevant. He just had to keep being talked about, even if it meant being notorious. They built a false boardroom on the vacant fifth floor of Trump Tower. My first time meeting Donald Trump, we walked into the boardroom, we were seated, and about 20 minutes later, the camera started rolling, and Donald Trump walked in. The show transformed Donald Trump into this persona. OK, folks, I'm really busy today, so we're going to go quickly who almost completely redeemed the pre-apprentice Donald Trump. It's a little treat. You're going to see the nicest apartment in New York City. It's my apartment. In ways that are so substantial and so um, deep-seated that would the apprentice not be in the picture, I, I couldn't see him running for president. Every episode was a crisis. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. No longer with us. You're fired. I have to say you're fired. Please, please I have no stop. choice, and I have to say that you're fired. The carefully choreographed drama hooked the audience, keeping them coming back for more. What's the, the ethos of reality TV? It's that fighting is the best state of human life. It's that life is a competition. It's zero sum. For you to win, somebody else has got to lose. Donald Trump, Donald Trump had become a reality TV star, 
inside millions of homes every week for years and years. After The Apprentice, he was Donald Trump on steroids. <laughs> it's like, this guy was bigger than life. He was everywhere. Reality TV show host, U.S. president. Reality it was time for Trump to take his brand to the next Trump. level. Donald Trump's recent White House flirtation has gone above and beyond. He would run for president. He recognized that entertainment is now a central part of American politics. Donald Trump actually decided that you can fuse everything that he had learned uh, about celebrity and entertainment and ratings from having been on The Apprentice into a presidential campaign. His announcement mirrored The Apprentice. It was staged just like a Celebrity Apprentice thing. We had staged one of the Celebrity Apprentice things in that same place. The camera angles were the same, uh, lighting was the same. He understood the drama of coming down the escalator. The orchestration of it recognizes his showmanship. He's a showman above all. A crowd filled out with, yes, with actual actors who were promised 50 bucks a pop to simulate enthusiasm for him and play a role in a similar way to the way that he was playing a role. Ladies and gentlemen, I am officially running for President of the United States, and we are going to make our country great again. The developer who went bust, the reality TV star, was on his way, harnessing the power of crisis and conflict, image over reality. Another day, another entry in the presidential race. Delaware Senator Joe Biden is the ninth Democrat to jump in. It was 2007. Joe Biden was running for president again. But that very day... It sure isn't easy running for president these days. It all blew up. This was not a good day for Joe Biden, was it? No, it really wasn't, Katie. Just got into the race today, and no sooner than he did, he talked his way into a national controversy. Spent much of the day discussing these comments he made to a newspaper reporter about Senator Barack Obama. I mean, you got the first sort of mainstream African-American yeah. who was articulate and bright and... And clean, nice looking guy. I mean, it's, that's a storybook, man. Yeah. Some people listening to those descriptions of Obama, articulate, clean, heard racial overtones, or at the very least, condescension. I think when people heard the clean and articulate line, there was a wave of eye rolling, certainly among African Americans. It was the kind of well intentioned but benighted commentary that you expect from people who inhabit environments where there aren't very many black people. And the United States Senate has historically been a prime example of that. Tonight, his campaign is doing damage control. He'd been here before, damage control. Kennock, Anita Hill. Joe Biden's apologizing for a remark he made about Senator Barack Obama, saying, quote, I deeply regret any offense my He followed the playbook. Apologize, persevere. This is the Daily Show with John Stewart. Nice to see you. Do you want to talk about the comments uh, specifically that that have generated uh, the controversy? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, no, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> the Philadelphia Inquirer yesterday, you were quoted as saying, "The one lesson I learned from my previous presidential run is." words matter that's right and you can't take words lightly and then you came out with this one all right here you go <laughs> listen to this one this is great barack obama i mean you got the first mainstream african-american who's articulate and bright and clean and a nice looking guy i mean that's a storybook man well let me tell you something i i spoke to barack today i, I spoke... bet you did <laughs> I also spoke to Jesse and Al Sharpton, and uh, and uh, and I also and Michael spoke to Jordan no, and anybody no, no, you no, could no, get no, your no, hands no. on. Michael the Jackson Five. Michael Who else? Michael didn't call me. Uh, it was a reminder 
that this was somebody who was capable of doing those kinds of things, who was in many ways uh, his own worst enemy, whether it was because he, he didn't know when to stop speaking or, or because he could say things in the moment um, that would get him into trouble. The latest news is that Joe Biden is dropping out of the race. Joe Biden is dropping out of Once the race. Once again, Joe Biden's campaign would collapse. But he wasn't taking himself out of the game. He'd make it personal, build a relationship with Obama. Out of competition came mutual respect, and mutual respect led to uh, a real relationship, a friendship. And Joe Biden became somebody uh, that President Obama looked to for advice and counsel. You are not going to get anything out of me off the vice president. Nothing. Soon, that relationship would pay off as Obama sought a running mate. I got to say that I've, I've, I've made the selection, and that's all you're going to get. I think Obama really liked the idea of choosing the guy who had said these things about him that so many other people found offensive, of showing this kind of magnanimity around racial issues and racial rhetoric uh, that I think was key to his winning. Obama asked him to be on his ticket as vice president. At the house in Wilmington, the Biden inner circle gathered. He was not going to do it. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt he's not going to do it. We had another one of those family meetings and a few key, key people. The kid said to me, Mom, you have to talk Dad into running. And I said, Joe, this is such a great moment in history. His mom said, well, well, Joe, she called him Joey. She said, well, Joey, you're telling me that the first African-American president in history thinks that you can help him get elected, and you're saying no? Game, set, match. It was over. Barack Obama is projected to be the next president. Senator Barack Obama of Illinois. He turned a political crisis into a relationship and became vice president. He had already squared away in his mind that he understood that Barack Obama was president, Joe was vice president, and Joe understood the job of vice president and, and, uh, and wore it well. In the Obama White House, Biden brought with him something the president didn't have, relationships in Congress spanning decades. These were his recently former colleagues, and he knew that he could call them, and they would take his call, and that he could go and thrash issues out with them uh, with a degree of comfort that President Obama didn't have because he hadn't known them as long as Vice President Biden. Biden became Obama's trusted partner. The real question isn't, what thing did you do if you're vice president? The real question is, how much influence did you have? And I think Biden understands power and leveraging power. I think he had a genuine relationship with Obama. They spent a lot of time talking. But I, I think he was a very influential vice president uh, in that way and, a, and an extremely loyal vice president. In return, Obama bestowed on Biden something special, a kind of political sainthood they called the Obama halo. Joe Biden has the Obama halo. Everybody knows that. That is the cleansing of Joe Biden and everything that may have happened. And there's such a great irony that someone who was the architect of the 94 crime bill and a white man of this age, when I mean, you think about Anita Hill, his crutch, his, the reason for his success, is a black man with a funny name who's kind of skinny from Hawaii by way of Kansas. Cowardice, are you serious? Apologies for freedom, I can't handle this. Enemies 2015, Donald Trump's presidential campaign, made for TV spectacle. A showcase with all the conflict and crisis. Turn them. Go ahead, turn them. Go ahead. Knock the crap out of them, would you? Seriously. Just knock the hell. I promise you, 
I will pay for the legal fees, I promise. You've called women you don't like fat pigs? Only Rosie O'Donnell. By the time Trump arrives running for president in 2016. How does my hair look? Is it okay? He understands conflict. He understands celebrity. He understands the power of television. And he understands how to dominate. And against his opponents, another strategy he had perfected, personal attack. Little Marco. This little guy has lied so much. Lion Ted. The and I'll, single and I'll biggest you. liar. You probably are worse than Jeb Bush. You are the single biggest. All of this is classic Trump. This is the person he's been, I think, since he was five years old. Donald told me that he is essentially the person he was in first grade and that he hasn't really changed. But a month before the election, the Trump camp has swiftly launched into disaster mode. This is a, a bombshell. A big, big development in this campaign as it comes to That day, we're up in the 25th floor conference room, and it's Friday afternoon, about 2 o'clock. And Hope Hicks was notified by the media that they had Donald Trump having a conversation with Billy Bush uh, that said a number of incendiary things, and they were going to publish the transcript. She got this transcript, and she's like about to cry. She goes, oh, this is terrible. I gotta use some Tic Tacs just in case they start kissing her. The Trump team watched it online. You know, I'm automatically attracted to beautiful. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. <laughs> and when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab them by the <laughs> I can do anything. <laughs> like, whoa, boom, that thing hits. In video, it's pretty powerful, so everything shuts down. Everybody, and everybody isn't quite everybody, but most people, both in and outside the campaign, thought it would end his candidacy. Donald Trump's campaign, its worst crisis ever. The future of a campaign that is in dire straits. I think the question now is, how do Republicans break away from Trump's it? Trump's campaign so was in free fall. Reince Priebus, the chairman of the Republican National Committee, confronted Trump. Reince Priebus basically said, you need to get out of the race. And Donald Trump said no. He said, I'm not getting out of the race. Not only am I not getting out of the race, I'm going to go and run, I'm going to win. He would ignore the political experts. In that moment, he won the presidency. There was 90% chance we were gone the other way that day, from the night before, from the pressure that was on him and everything like that. And that's what a leader does. In the midst of crisis, he turned to what he had learned from Norman Vincent Peale, Roy Cohn, his dad, reality TV. I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody, and I wouldn't lose any voters, OK? It's like incredible. He went on the attack. Every woman lied when they came forward to hurt my campaign. Changed the subject, stoking racial division. And we will keep radical Islamic terrorists the hell economic fears. We are going to renegotiate our terrible trade deal. Frustration with Washington. It is time to drain the damn swamp. And making big promises. We will build a great wall. And we will make America great again. Donald Trump will be the 45th president of the United States. Amidst outrage and anger, he won the ultimate prize and stayed true to his playbook. I think what Donald Trump learned from his entire run for president is that he could really only count on himself. He needed to rely on his own political instincts to figure out how to move forward. Through the Obama years, building racial tension, outrage over police violence against African Americans. Get out of the then, news of a revenge shooting against the police. We begin tonight with breaking news, a deadly police shooting in New York City. Two New York City police officers are dead following an ambush Saturday afternoon. They were quite simply assassinated. 
Amateur video captured the frantic scene as paramedics desperately tried to save the lives of officers Wen Jin Liu and Rafael Ramos. As the vice president, Joe Biden often tackled controversies. And in matters of race particularly, Obama relied on him to walk a fine line he could not. One of Joe Biden's chief responsibilities was to be an ambassador to the country, specifically to the white parts of the country, where Barack Obama's presence might have only further inflamed uh, the situation. Now Biden was dispatched to New York. 25,000 police officers are all there to it say goodbye. It was tense. The sea of blue filled the city streets. Many police, police officers, officers lined the streets the as Biden arrived. Of NYPD officers lining the streets outside of the funeral service. When here. we got out of the cars, you could see that this mass of police had changed him. Thousands of people lining the streets. Gathered to shoulder to shoulder at a Queens, New York church to say farewell to a While we had understood the gravity and the sensitivity, I don't think it really hit any of us until we saw the tens of thousands of police there. He used his method, keep it personal, talk directly to the family of Officer Rafael Ramos. Our hearts ache for you. I know from personal experience that uh, there is little anyone can say or do at this moment to, uh, to ease the pain, that sense of loss, that sense of loneliness. Joe Biden has been defined in public life by heartbreak and empathy. That when Joe Biden steps up at the funeral, you know that those tears are real. That the time will come. The time will come when Raphael's memory will bring a smile to your lips before it brings a tear to your eyes. That's when you know it's going to be OK. I know it's hard to believe that it'll happen, but I promise you, I promise you it will happen. It's an odd role in public life to be known as a person associated with grief. And Joe Biden never wanted to be that person, actually. It was not how he imagined his own political future. But because of his life, he ended up being this public political symbol of suffering and of resilience. And eventually, he embraced it. But he actually didn't want to be that. That day, there was unfinished business. Biden wanted to see Officer Wen Jian Lu's family. We came out of the church, and Joe said, I want to offer my condolences to him as well, to them, to that family. He wanted to go and meet them and talk with them. So the police worked it out so that we could visit, and they had a translator there. I can remember walking up the stairs with, the, with an interpreter, and the family was all um, crammed into this tiny kitchen, and we sat and we talked to them. And we must have been in there, I don't know, a good hour. I started to notice that Wen Jun Lu's father had rarely left my side. Occasionally, he would lean into me so that his shoulder touched my arm. Thank you, he kept saying. Thank you, thank you. We went out on the sidewalk, and the father, who didn't even speak English, I mean, just held on to Joe. And I mean, he was so grateful that Joe had come to offer condolences to uh, the family. We stood there for a long while, embracing on the little sidewalk in front of the house where he had lived with his only son. Just two fathers. I understood all that he wanted me to know. After decades in politics, Biden seemed to have finally found his place. But soon after the crisis in New York, a personal crisis, yet again. Biden was burying his own son, Bo. He was the apple of Biden's eye. He was not just someone who he thought was brilliant and successful and just so proud of him. 
It went beyond pride. It was almost like he's the perfect version of me. <laughs> Bo had served in Iraq. He was Attorney General of Delaware. They talked about the presidency someday. Joe often describes him as Joe 2.0, and he looked like his dad. He had a lot of the same skill sets as his father. He was very charismatic. He was charming. He was funny. But then, brain cancer. Death at 46. Bo Biden, former Delaware Attorney General and eldest son of Vice President Joe Biden, died. President Saturday. Biden's office was the first to announce his son's death tonight. The president tonight. was with his son, Bo, when he passed away tonight at Walter Very Reed sad Man. news. Bo Biden lost his battle with brain cancer. Family and friends gathered at St. Anthony's Church in Wilmington yesterday to pay their respects. Some waited in line for up to six hours. Line, line five blocks long outside the church. At one point, after several hours, a surprise. There was Mr. Liu and his wife, and they came to uh, give us comfort. It was just two men, really, who had gone through something horrible, um, just offering comfort to one another. Before Bo's death, Biden had been considering another run for president. Now the question was not just would he, but could he? I was happened to be in Obama's White House, and he walked in. And I honestly, it was almost like I didn't recognize him. This was shortly after Bo died. He just looked like he had aged uh, years and years in such a short amount of time. Through crisis and tragedy, Joe Biden had his eyes on the presidency. But now, in grief, he would decide to stand down. From the very beginning of Donald Trump's presidency, he ignited crisis. This American carnage stops right here and stops right now. It's a crisis. Donald Trump's president of the United States, now comes the hour of action. There's been enough talk. Week one, a travel ban aimed at Muslim countries. A scene of outrage at JFK Airport in New York. Now protests, outrage, and backlash. To me, it just felt like continuing chaos. North Korea will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. Ongoing threats to other nations. There was no effort to say, what are the priorities here? And I think he makes decisions quickly and can change them very quickly, too. And uh, uh, sometimes to be 180 degrees of what he had decided just a few hours before. And just like The Apprentice, firings, turmoil, confrontation. We've had uh, reality TV framing for the presidency. If you see the serial exits of people who you know, really had built significant careers only to be kicked around and then ejected unceremoniously. Rance Priebus, John Spicer, Anthony Scaramucci, John Kelly, General Mattis, people who were just kind of chewed up and spat out humiliated in the course of it in their interactions with Trump. The FBI investigation was their collusion. Overshadowing it all, allegations of collusion with Russia, obstruction of justice. Russian collusion, give me a break. President Trump now facing outrage after firing home. I did you a great favor when I fired this guy, I tell you. That you may have I'm not concerned about anything with you the may Russian investigation because it's a hoax. Are you, That's enough. Put down the mic. Mr. President, are you worried about indictments coming down in this investigation? He lashed out. Breaking news, the White House in crisis. The Justice Department appointed a special counsel to investigate. Well, this is a pure and simple witch hunt. At first blush, maybe he really hates it and he's annoyed by the Mueller investigation or the media attacks or this or that. 
But when you look at it further, he sort of enjoys the jousting, he enjoys the fighting. It was the presidency Roy Cohn had prepared him for. He learned from Roy Cohn, attack, never apologize, seem to be in charge, was true then and is true today. Wait a minute, I'm not finished, fake news. He was determined to be what his father had called a killer. They are very, very dishonest people. Fake news. Donald Trump. Three years of chaos would culminate in impeachment. To be impeached. The absolutely crazed lunatics, the Democrats, radical left. He did what he always did. Are pushing the deranged impeachment witch hunt for doing nothing wrong. He only has the one playbook. He uses it no matter what the crisis. In the shadow of impeachment. It didn't matter when the casinos went bust. It didn't matter when his whole financial empire seemed to collapse. He was able to maintain the brand. And so he ratchets up the anger. He ratchets up the insults. And in those first years, it seemed to work. This is what the end result is. Really wasn't, in my opinion, until the US Senate voted for acquittal on the two impeachment charges that Donald Trump finally had a small air of breathability. So, you could take that home, honey, maybe we'll frame it. It's the only good headline I've ever had in the Washington Post. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. He had unified the party behind him, left his imprint on the Supreme Court, delivered tax cuts, undermined Washington's institutions. My grandfather remains Donald's audience of one. It's to him Donald's continually trying to prove himself. For the first time in decades, Joe Biden was a private citizen, watching Donald Trump's presidency. But then came Charlottesville. That was really the tipping point. When he heard President Trump say there are very fine, some very fine people on both sides, that was it. That was the tipping point. In the streets, violent clashes between white supremacists and counter-protesters. It's hard to believe, based on his own statements, that Joe Biden doesn't see some level of personal responsibility for the rise of Donald Trump. Joe Biden was the vice president, and he chose not to run for president. You have to imagine that's weighed pretty heavily on Joe Biden. He decided to do something about it. At 76 years old, he would reverse course, run one more time. He was seen as yesterday's news. He was a very rickety ship. Uh, he was not as eloquent as he was 30 years ago, like most people wouldn't be. And um, he also, you know, he was saddled with a very, very long record, some of it going back to the 70s. From NBC News, Decision 2020, the Democratic candidates debate. In those early days, his long, complicated record was a liability. I'm gonna now direct this at Vice President Biden. You oppose busing. And, you know, there was a little girl in California who was part of the second class to integrate her public schools. And she was bused to school every day. And that little girl was me. It wasn't about the specifics of the busing so debate. It was a signal. It was saying that this is a white guy who is so old that he was taking a position on busing in the first place. But they, uh, Vice President Biden, do you agree today, do you agree today that you were wrong to oppose busing in America? That Precisely because he has such a long track record in American politics, you can point to him being on the wrong side of questions that are now considered to be completely settled. It would be the first of many rough nights on the campaign trail. 
Meanwhile, in a stunning reversal, Joe Biden's campaign struggles to match rival presidential candidates. In the numbers are down among women, down among independents. The drop is primarily among younger He struggled to excite voters. President Joe Biden struggling in the polls here. Will Joe Biden is his campaign in trouble. The he was selling what he always had, Joe Biden, and it wasn't working. The truth is he does not have some transformational or different vision for the country. Uh, it's a t it's a tough campaign for him. Joe Biden presently trailing in fourth place. I'm surprised how bad Joe Biden did. He fled the One state. One of his senior advisors had to call him and have what she described to me as the conversation you never want to have with a candidate, which is, we may be approaching the point of having to shut this thing down. Joe Biden is fighting for his political survival. Critical but he wasn't giving up. South Carolina, if he has any chance, the fact his last hope for a break time, in particular for Joe Biden. South Carolina. All the rest on South Carolina. Joe Biden has spent a lot of time in South Carolina. He can relate to South Carolinians. South Carolina was very, very important to Joe Biden. To win, he desperately needed the black vote. Joe Biden's been around for a long time. People comfortable with him. They get him. They understand him. Even if they don't agree with him, they think he's, you know, a good faith actor. That means a lot to a community of people who have been betrayed and oppressed and tricked and lied to. Someone who you can trust at their word, that goes a very long way. It was what he had done in that first Senate race making it personal, connecting. News is projecting former Vice President Joe Biden is the winner. He gave Biden a victory. Invigorated largely by black voters in the state. Joe Biden wins big. Three days later. In a political earthquake, these are the results nobody saw coming. Let's go he straight. rode the momentum and dominated Super Tuesday. He pulled off one of the biggest political upsets in modern political history. Soon, he won it all. In its own way, it's the culmination of all of his training and ambition and his mistakes and his regrets and his attempts to be better. And it, and it came together at last. Biden has made his pick. And when the time came, and the, pick is in, the man who had made plenty of mistakes decision announced via text and asked for political forgiveness decision turned to the opponent who'd gone after him on the campaign trail, Kamala Harris, as his running mate. Kamala Harris and picked her as his running mate. The African-American community will help propel him to the White House. It was an opportunity for him to distinguish himself from Donald Trump that I actually want to bring the person who's criticized me most harshly into the fold because I value dissenting opinions. And that was part of the message that was being sent uh, with Kamala Harris. Growing worries in response to the deadly coronavirus. Wuhan, China, that's the epicenter of Wuhan, China. The pandemic. A nation in crisis. It's now under lockdown. Philippines confirmed its first death. France is confirming the... Italy is taking unprecedented... This is Italy's darkest hour. A threat Donald Trump was trying to play down. Coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. Worldwide, including at least 12 confirmed... A tragic turn in the coronavirus outbreak. The first death from the disease... He used the Norman Vincent Peale approach. Visualize what you want to be true. No matter the facts. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. We're ready for it. It is what it is. We're ready for it. You have 15 people, and the 15 within a couple of days is going to be down to close to zero. Uh, that's a pretty good job we've done. As the country deals with this worst pandemic, they're seeing in a man that doesn't see any problems. He always sees a rosy, bright future, and that he can succeed. There's no question that in the first several months of 2020, staff on the NSC and the Centers for Disease Control were raising red flags about what was happening in China. The president was determined not to hear any bad news. But we have done an incredible job. We're going to continue. It's going to disappear. One day, it's like a miracle. It will disappear. This unwillingness to think about the implications meant there was no strategic planning going on, because that would have meant acknowledging we were facing 
uh, a severe threat, and he simply did not want to do that. Empty streets lead to packed emergency rooms across New York City. Paralysis in this typically vibrant city in just a matter of weeks. The As the death toll rose. FEMA sent 85 refrigerated trucks to New York City to hold the people who've perished. He doubled down. Now the Democrats are politicizing the coronavirus. You know that, right? Coronavirus. They're politicizing it. Very Roy Cohn, very School of Dad, very Norman Vincent Peale. Just insist that you're successful. Insist that what you're doing is right. right now, what do you say to Americans who are watching you right now who are scared? Uh, I say that you're a terrible reporter. That's what I say. Go ahead. I think it's a very nasty question, and I think it's a very bad signal that you're putting out to the American people. That's part of this playbook. Double down, triple down, say any problems are somebody else's fault. And in the midst of the pandemic, once again, racial strife. <laughs> Get in the car. Mama. Get up. We get Mama. in the car right. Get off the car now. Get off the car. What the? Bro, oh, he's not moving. George Floyd killed by police. And that opens the floodgates. I can't breathe. we saw in the days and weeks to follow that was this confluence of these multiple factors. The deeply, deeply frustrated Black Lives Matter movement of a particularly incendiary video. That movement was cognizant of the fact that Trump had consistently talked to police and urged them to uh, behave more aggressively. Trump's approval ratings were plummeting. Protesters were massing outside the White House. In the Rose Garden that day, he would go to his playbook, fan the flames. Our nation has been gripped by professional anarchists, Violent mobs, arsonists, looters, criminals, rioters, Antifa. What Trump is trying to do is change the subject, that Antifa um, is, is the new enemy. Donald Trump likes to find enemies um, and to hold those up as uh, that he is the protector against those. As we speak, I am dispatching thousands and thousands of heavily armed soldiers, military personnel, and law enforcement officers to stop the rioting, looting, vandalism, assaults, and the wanton destruction of property. As he spoke, a choreographed show of force across the street from the White House. I'm sitting on the corner of Pennsylvania and 17th Street. And I start coughing and choking, and I start wondering what's going on. And I look up, and it's it's clouds of smoke, and it's officers throwing some sort of chemical gas that is making my throat and my eyes burn, and I see people running. And this line of police officers coming, and they're clearing the streets. And I'm completely confused because I'm wondering, why is the White House doing this? Then the president left the Rose Garden for a dramatic TV moment. I felt badly for some of the people who were in that uh, march. I've been asked what I would do, and I've said I probably would have gone along. How am I going to say no? and then I would have felt very badly about it later. But that's an effect Trump has on people. Really, it's just a picture. It's just an image of the president being in charge. And that's his vision of what the president is, the guy in charge. 
He's just in charge. For Joe Biden, the nation in crisis gave him an opportunity. May history be able to say that the end of this chapter of American darkness began here tonight as love and hope and light join in the battle for the soul of the nation. One last chance to see if making it personal, persevering in the face of adversity can prevail. This is a battle we will win and we'll do it together. For Donald Trump, a lifetime of conflict had prepared him for yet another fight. And this election will decide whether we will defend the American way of life or whether we will allow a radical movement to completely dismantle and destroy it. Another chance to see if turning crisis to his advantage can carry the day. Together we are unstoppable. Together we are unbeatable. Now, a deeply divided nation will decide. Policy is not the choice that's on the ballot this year. It is a choice of character. It is a choice of temperament. It is a choice of persona and personality. That's always a factor in our presidential campaigns. But I don't think it's ever been as big a factor as it will be in November.